Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Knight, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it. It's DR6 8AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number. That's 01453 isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group. That's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well, they need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? 20? 18. And should we put in the age range that's 13 to 22? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though. Oh, OK. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least £50. OK. And what else? Oh, I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So, 
We could put an acknowledgement in that. Yeah, that's a better idea. OK, and the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services, and they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right, I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list, so for you it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are Are there enough toilet facilities and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier free so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you. Within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. 
These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organiser in their busy conference centre, organising and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at 9am, so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at 10am and then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3.30pm and after that you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this and it'll leave from outside the refectory at 8am. You'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library, and it'll run from 10.30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions.
Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange: blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs, and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed twelve containers overboard. Inside the containers were twenty-nine thousand plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened, and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out. And began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up. In Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship, some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me. Hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii; others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington. And Oregon, can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at 9 o'clock in the morning and close at 5.30 in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs, smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime. And once a week, there tends to be an early closing day when most shops shut during the afternoon. Many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage, which is 240 volts, 58Z. Many hotels will, on request, be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from 9 o'clock to 5.30, Monday to Friday, and until 12.30 on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers, at large stores and major tourist attractions. For posting letters, you don't have to go far before finding a red painted letterbox. Alternatively, use the letterboxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge, usually 10 to 12 per cent, but in some larger hotels, 15%. Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15% of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15% is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis, 10 to 15% of the fare. Hairdressers, £2 according to how much work they have done, plus 50p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seatbelts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association, AA or Royal Automobile Club, RAC, at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA. Telephone is 01 854 7373, 24 hour service. RAC telephone is 
O three O four two zero four two five six. Twenty four hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital, or, in the case of severe emergency, dial nine nine nine. Nine 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 is free. Remember, unless you belong to a European Community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute 